And his spiritual sounds and his uh, philosophies are very wonderful. His music of rock and roll and blues is tremendous. He was a recent guest on my 20-year running Church of Rock radio show. And I've invited him here today for a more spiritual chat, and I'm grateful that he accepted my offer. He's based in Montreal, Canada. Uh, his band is Mahogany Rush, and he's, uh, again, considered to be one of the most underrated guitar players of all time. Please welcome uh, to the Earth Heart Radio Show, Frank Marino. Hi, Frank. Hi, Derek. How are you? Good. I hope you heard the big build up there. I heard the build up and I was suitably embarrassed. <laughs> oh, that's because you're a nice, humble guy, and I appreciate it, man. Mm. How's it going in Montreal? It's a gray day with some rain, and uh, other than that, it's pretty slow. <laughs> Everything is pretty slow, but I kind of like it slow. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, you know, I've been a fan of yours for so long, and it's. As I told you when we did another interview, I'm, it's, I'm so grateful to have you uh, as not only a, someone to talk to on the, as a hero of mine, but a friend, because you've made yourself available as a friend. Have you always considered yourself a spiritual being? Have you always been conscious of the spiritual self? I became conscious of it um, very early in my life, but I fought it. So, like most people who are young, uh, I became conscious of it in a number of extre ex extraordinary ways, actually. And uh, I did, you know, I deny, didn't really deny it, but I kind of went, well, I, you know, more about that later type of thing. You know, when you're a young boy, yeah. 13 and whatever. So, yes, I had, uh, I had some serious, what people would consider really serious experiences like that. But, um, but then eventually, as I was in the rock and roll world, and of course, in that world, I wasn't, you know, I had retired very young from imbibing in any kind of drugs or drink. You know, from the moment I started, actually, in rock and roll, I wasn't doing anything. And um, so it just became, um, a, you know, me going through the entire rock and roll career of almost 50 years, uh, looking at it from a very different vantage point than, let's say, uh, the rest of my uh confrères yeah yeah no. uh you, you a person here's what i think Derek. okay i don't think that any one person has any more let's say spirituality or speciality than anyone else uh i think what happens is it's almost like everybody's given the same dinner but some people don't want to eat it all. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think it's, it's the acceptance, you know, uh, the, the whole thing about Christianity, especially I'm an Orthodox Christian, which is a little bit different than, than let's say mainstream Protestant or those, you know, Western Christian. But the main idea of being Orthodox, which me simply means that you do ortho means straight like straight teeth orthodontist and dox means doctrine so it's a straight doctrine and it's very original so it's very much rooted in the root of christianity and that is itself rooted in things like acceptance mercy obedience that's basically what christianity is and um we can we can begin to uh quantify all the little nuances about it but that's like trying to quantify all the blades of grass on a lawn hmm. you still have to look at the lawn <laughs> <That's>, yeah <laughs> you know the, the quantification of each different blade of grass doesn't really change the idea that you've got you've got a lawn right and uh, that's that's sort of the way i you know am um but early on in answer to your question, yes, early on when I started noticing those things, I was, you know, normally a kid who would say, oh, no, no, I don't, I don't want to go there. <laughs> right. You know? Later um, on, I moved towards it. I have a question maybe you can answer. Is Orthodox Christianity anything like the old mystical Christianity? No. I mean, well, mystical. Um, Christianity is a mystery yeah. in and of itself. So it's a mystery that is, uh, as it's revealed in pieces, it's no longer mysterious. So we can call things a mystery until we know what they are. And so Christianity, you know, in the, in the, um, 
In the Old uh, Covenant, they have a uh, proverb that basically says, don't eat honey too fast, lest you vomit it out, and then you don't want it anymore. Mm. Honey means the Word of God. Ah. And if you take it too fast, those are the people that say they're all enjoyed by it. Wow, it's sweet, it's great, it's wonderful, but they take too much, and then they don't want it anymore. They vomit it out, say, I'm sick of this. That, then they become an apostate to it. So it's, God has never, ever given anybody... Um, revelation too quickly yeah um or anything too quickly and we even see that in the old old testament stories when he tells joshua yeah you're going to finally go in and take these cities but you're not going to take them all at once that's an allegory for how you will learn the word of god yeah um you, you have to take things slowly or else you'll turn against it and so it's no good for you yeah so when it's so for, when first you say a mystery it's a mystery until we have the revelation of it. Well, I was speaking... The rest is a mystery. <laughs> I was more... I think I was talking more about... Um, I know my wife, who um, has studied religion and has some degrees in, in, in religious studies, was telling me there were some page, uh, parts of the Bible that were removed at one point, and there was an actual religion that was actually called mystical Christianity, which is very... Yeah, mysticism. Very close, mysticism. close to... I know what you're talking about. Kind of close to Hinduism, yeah. sort of, with their belief systems, you know? Well, yes, but here's the thing. This is the way I look at it, and this is very, if you want, orthodox, okay? But I'm talking in a normal way, because we have to be careful, because the, the, the English Bible, you know, we, we, we study the Bible mostly in English. I mean, people over here speak English, so yeah. we're going by that whole English version of the Bible, which really didn't come about till about 1535, when William Tyndale, you know, uh, translated it, and then King James burnt him at the stake and said he was a heretic, then took his work and called it the King James Bible. So that's a history of the Bible. The, you know, the Bible. But we have to be careful that the Bible, the Bible is a, is a record of God's dealings with men. The Bible doesn't save you. The knowledge within the Bible can give you the indication of what you need to do, but the, the book itself, the words themselves, don't perform any saving grace. They haven't, the words don't have the life. God has the life. Yeah. And it's the life of God or the grace of God that saves a person. So when we start to get caught up in, well, they had this book and they had that book and then they took this one out and then they put that one in, when people start to get caught up in that, the, the message that they lose is the most important message of all which is mercy. And so, if you, if you think about it, if you applied that same idea of looking at religion that way, as a knowledgeable thing, as a Gnostic thing, then you would be the same type of person who would say, I don't just trust that the multiplication table is objectively true, I have to go around proving it every day to myself. Yeah. And nobody does that with mathematics. Right. People just accept that the ratio of a circle is true, objectively. The ratio of a right triangle is true, objectively. It's not subjective. It does not require me to d agree with whether A squared plus B squared is C squared. Because these are objective truths that are there, and we discover them. We don't invent them. So we discover the objective truth about Christ, about God, Mm. about human spirit, what we call spirituality, we discover those objective truths a little at a time. Yeah. And the way you always know that you've actually discovered an objective truth is because once you know it, you will treat it with the same level of non-amazement that you do the multiplication table. Mm. So a person that objectively knows that it's true the sun will go down tomorrow, uh, to, uh, tonight, he doesn't think about that as an amazing thing. It's just a fact. Yeah. If we appear, the sky appears blue to people. It's not really blue, but we say the sky is blue for lack of a better word. Nobody's sort of amazed that the sky is there or that it's blue. That's true faith. Faith that is so real that it's no longer amazing to you. It's just objectively true. Yeah. And Christ is objectively true, mm. not subjectively true. And, and consequently, like the multiplication table, there are not many ways to interpret the multiplication table. <laughs> right. There's just one. And that's it. That's orthodox. That's very, very straight doctrine to the point, to the root. Very well said. Yes. Yeah. Matt, we, look, 
we do this, people do this all the time. You live in a house. It's a beautiful home. You bought it. I don't know, whatever, okay? Nice home. It's got a beautiful bedroom. It's got a nice living room. You got your TV. You got everything upstairs. But then why would you go down to the basement every day to rip out the walls and look at the joists of the people that built the house? as if somehow that makes your living room any better. Right. There were people before us who did the building, who wrote the history. That's essential. That's kind of like the people who built the house. And they did that so that we could live in the living room without having to go look at the walls downstairs. <laughs> so when we, when we continually go down to look at our earliest structures, it's because we either we don't have faith our living room's going to stand up, <laughs> or we're not happy with it. We're right. ungrateful. And, and Christ is the culmination of that. He's the house upstairs yeah. that, that a person lives in because of all the things that came and all the things that were said that we call mysteries, that we're not always trying to accept as simply the truth. And we're trying to either prove it or disprove it by finding documents and saying, look at this or look at that. But when we do that, don't forget, you live for a limited amount of minutes, and every amount and every minute that you spend doing that is a minute off your clock mm. that you could have been doing the other thing. That's right. And, and I think, you know, there are forces that would well, pre you know, prefer that we did those other things you know, seeking out all the little reasons to criticize. Yeah. But that's, that's orthodox. When I say orthodox, I don't mean gi giant O, I mean small O. <laughs> orthodox. Um, can I ask and you... that's what I am. That's how I live my life. Okay, and that segues perfectly into my next question. Um, a lot of folks that were, you know, that are and were a fan of your music, they know relatively little about what happened when you actually got your strange dreams hit the charts and you were getting to be a more well-known name in households because of your music. You decided to walk away from the business for at least a decade, right? What did you do during oh, that? Well, I mean, that happened more than once that I walked away from the business, uh, but, you know, walked away and then was dragged back kicking and screaming, but I, you know, did, I walked away from the majors for sure in around 82, 83. Right. Uh, but it didn't just have to do with the strange dreams episode. That was just sort of the culmination. I kind of really didn't want to be there all throughout the seventies. Okay. What did you and, do during you know, those times when you said, I'm not doing music right now? What, what did you do with your time? Well, I always did music. I just didn't do music as Frank the musician. Ah, right? So okay. I don't believe people are hyphenated people. Like, I'm just Frank, and you're just Derek. Right. It's not Derek the Reverend or Frank the Musician. or it, That hyphenates you. Mm. But and in fact, when you do that, you either put yourself at a lesser position or a greater position than someone else by definition of hyphenating yourself. Good point. You're distinguishing yourself from the rest yeah. in either a positive or negative way. Mm -hmm. So when I walk away from the major biz part of the business, it wasn't music I'm walking away from. It's the way they handle music. Yeah, the ethics. And I think that, yeah, it's like, or, look what they do. Or I mean, lack, like, lack, of, kidding me? lack of ethics, I should say, maybe. Well, yeah, and, and, and sometimes it's not even a lack of ethics. It's just, pardon the criticism, it's just plain ignorance. Yeah. Sometimes it's just ignorance, but it, ignorance is okay if it's not willful, right? Yeah. But you can you can be ignorant isn't isn't um, an actual insult. It's a description of somebody that has ignored something. But he could have ignored it because he didn't know. But it, when it's willful ignorance, that's when you have the difference between whether you want to. You know, you said I heard you say earlier you are who you hang around with or something i don't remember exactly the, com it. the company that you keep yeah yeah the company you keep well just remember when you're not keeping company with others of any persuasion you are still keeping company with you mm -hmm. you're still a self right <laughs> so just like the other person is a self you know love yeah. someone as you love yourself you're still a self mm -hmm. so even in in the moments of your own meditation you're keeping company with yourself, mm. and hopefully you're making that company not lonely by keeping company with the objective truth of Jesus Christ. Mm. It, because you'll, you're never actually alone. You mm. just think you are. So most people will tell you, 
Well, you know, my soul, you know, my soul, my soul, my soul. They're talking as if they own a soul, as if they are the person they see in the mirror, and that person has a house, a car, a bank account, and a soul. But actually, they are the soul, and the soul has a body. You, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. Right. You have a body. Mm-hmm. And like everything else that you have, materially, a body, a car, a house, it all dies. The soul is what you are. That doesn't die. When your car dies and you're the driver, you get another car. <laughs> you're still the driver, unless you got killed <laughs> in the car. You know what I mean? I'm joking. But. I do, yeah. So people, if people will, will understand that they are the soul and not have a soul that they possess, they don't possess this soul. They are that. Mm-hmm. It's the body that they possess. And then they understand that even when they're alone in body, that soul the source of that life is God. Mm-hmm. That is, does not, it did, your soul or a soul did not create this universe. The source of all life is God. And the God that we can't know is God the Father, and the God that we can know is what we call God the Son. Mm. That's as much God as a, a human being can understand while yet being a human being. Did you have because to... Because we're finite. Did you have teachers? We're finite. God is infinite. For that reason alone, there's not enough time to understand infinity when you're finite. <laughs> True. So um, we're given an icon of the invisible God, the way people who don't know computers are given an icon of a program called Microsoft Word. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they think they're <laughs> running the program, but what's really happening when they're running the program is some other stuff's going on behind that they don't understand. Right. Binary good, code. Good analogy. So it's the same thing. So that's what I mean. It's so, it's so deep that God saw that we need to have it not deep. So he gives us what we can understand in his own person, mm. the divinity in a person. And it would be like if I went, if I had to tell fish living in a pond that there was a beach and a city and airplanes, they wouldn't be able to comprehend that. A fish can't comprehend a bicycle, but that doesn't make it any less of a good fish in its fish world. Right. Christ has to come to our level, God, at our level as the human, and suffer as humans, and go through what humans go through, so that he could do, you know the old expression, now you're talking my language. Yes. And then we understand that we need not know about the city or the airplanes, or all the other things, in order to simply exist as good as we were given and be grateful for who we are and what we are, male, female, God created them. And so many people don't have that gratitude. And when they think they're having gratitude, they're really having gratitude for things they possess Mm. rather than things they are. But God didn't give you possessions. He gave you you. He is you. I mean, he's the source of you. Right. And you're not the same as him or as great, but we need to be grateful for that. So, you know, the old parable about the cup telling the potter, why did you make me this way? Why didn't you make me a cup for good use instead of menial use? Or why did you make me a hand instead of a foot or an eye? (laughs) Right. People are always ungrateful. And I think the key to contentment is gratitude. A state of gratitude at all times. But a person cannot be in that state of gratitude unless he knows that there are good things. Ah. And if he's led to believe that everything is so evil that he despairs, he then believes in evil and believes evil wins. Yep. And the devil would like nothing more than that. Yeah. These are some trying times we're living in, too, man. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks listening right now that I, I hope are benefiting from this conversation because this show, uh, the intent is just to put out the vibration of love um, and very uh, accepting of very different beliefs uh, as far as spirituality. As long as love is behind it, I'm behind it. Um, I'm wondering, Frank, did you have any teachers growing up at all? Any Anybody that kind of was your teacher that you looked to besides God or the Bible? Was there any specific human teachers? No. No? No, I didn't. I didn't. I had a, a very odd, I had a very bad experience for a young boy 
when I, the last time I did psychedelic drugs as a young 13-year-old, and that landed me in a mental institution for a while, and I had to suffer through that. Hence the album covers and the psychedelic music that came after when I was trying to find myself for years. Yeah. And I've got a song called The Answer and all that stuff. I'm looking for the answer. But that may have been the impetus that pushed me towards trying to find something, and I found that. But I found that which my mother had always been a part of. My mother had always been Syrian Orthodox from the from Antioch and Syria, where where Christians were first called Christians. So you know you end up finding your root, but you know yes, we railed against it. But the experiences that I had as a young young boy were the impetus for me to finally latch on to what I'm saying to you today. But all of what I've understood over the fifty years that I've been doing this. They come little by little by little by little because they just make sense. You know, it happens to everybody. You know, you're going down a street and someone told you that, a, you know, this mountain looks like a rocking horse and you never see it. And one day you go, oh, wow, I see it. And that's like called a eureka moment. Mm. And you see something and then you can never unsee it. Right. So the truth, uh, the truth, the truth about Christ, about God, is one truth. And as you see parts of it, you know that's just true. Mm. It doesn't even amaze you when you find out how true it is. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and it becomes second nature. A musician knows that if he practices enough, the chord he couldn't play when he started becomes second nature. And when he's very good at it, he can almost not play the chord badly. It's by habit. You give a guitar player a guitar, he immediately plays E major. It was hard to do E major before he played guitar. So things become second nature, and so it is with trying to be with the truth. It mm. becomes second nature when you practice it, and that's why religion is called a practice. You know, the word religion comes from the Latin religare, which means to reconnect. So the idea of reconnection means that intuitively we suspect that we were connected and must have been disconnected, and so we must reconnect. Mm. I didn't know that's that. What that's what religion is. That's awesome. I've never heard that explained that way. Yeah, well, that's truly what it is. That's what the word means. But now we've made it mean other things, right? We've yeah. made religion mean another thing. We've made the word sin mean another thing. Sin simply means missing a mark. An arrow sins to the left or sins to the right. When it misses the target, we use the word sin. Mm. Now that means a different thing. People take, take the word faith. Everyone thinks faith is belief. Well, it's not. It's assurance. But one can never have assurance if he didn't start with belief. So we start by training in belief, and belief becomes assurance when it becomes second nature. Belief can only lead you to hope. If you have no belief, you'll be left with doubt. Hmm. If you have belief, you'll have hope, and hope leads to faith. So genuine faith is the feeling you have when the sun goes down and it means nothing to you because it's absolutely true. Right. That's faith. And we need to have that same kind of faith about Christ. Right. That kind of reality that, well, of course it's that way. <laughs> you know, this second nature. This is what true faith is. But very few have genuine faith. They have hope, which is a really good thing. But what they're always doing is hoping for more. Right, I agree. And Paul talks a lot about hope. Hope is a great thing. He mentions it a millions of times. So that's hope feeds, leads you to faith. Yeah, and faith is missing. Doubt moves you away from it. But you can't have hope unless you first believe. So we who teach at least try to get people to believe. And that's why Jesus says, if you don't believe me, for me, for my sake, at least believe the works that I do. Beautiful. Hey, Frank, I've got about five trying minutes. Trying to get them to start believing. Yeah. I've got about uh, five minutes, and I'm, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. Um, you're listening to KSKQ 89.5 FM, Ashland, Oregon. Uh, you're listening to an interview with Frank Marino from Montreal, Canada. Frank Marino, known uh, as the guitarist of Mahogany Rush, and so much more. Um, and I really wish I had more than just 30 minutes to talk, because you're such a great guy to talk with. Um, I guess I'd like to ask you, I heard that you are a private theology teacher. Is that true? Yes. That's kind of cool. Yes. Yeah, I didn't know that. Private meaning somebody wants to know and they want to learn, they come to me and we talk and we go through it. 
And it's very much like what I'm telling you now. Yeah. Now, of course, I can go into the books and bring out the Aramaic and bring out the Hebrew and bring out the Greek and start showing them that too. But I oftenly, I often don't, because as I said before, we end up quantifying little things that are antithetical to the, you know, to the proper understanding. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'll tell you this. The person that needs absolutely no training in proper Christian theology is the infant and the child. Wow. Because they already have it without knowing. And that's the greatest kind. Beautiful. They will believe and they will trust until we, we they get older and we begin to train them to doubt. <laughs> and then they become like people who have to <laughs> relegare, to get back. Right. To reconnect. And this is the, the cycle of life. So training someone who wants to learn theology, which means the science of God, oftentimes, if they simply want to learn it because it's interesting, and it is, nothing wrong with it, but there's a difference between theology, the science of God, which is the experimentation and looking at it from different ways, and what it actually is. I, I would imagine Jesus did not teach theology, neither did the apostles. <laughs> They probably could have. Oh, certainly. But they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you bring up some good points. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate you making the time. Do you do a lot of interviews, Frank? I do interviews with anyone who asks me at any time of the day or night. <laughs> I, just, I just know. Uh, I'm always available. I know after we did the last one, uh, it got posted online, and so many people came out of the woodwork thanking us for, like, you know, talking with you and putting something online with you. You've got a lot of people that really love you, man, all over the place. It's great. Well, I'm grateful for that. It's, it's very nice to know that. I wish that they all would hear what we're talking about now. And they will. Because to me, that is far more important than the music or the records that I do. The records and music I do are a gift from God, and I appreciate it. But that is not as essential as the understanding of Christ. Thank you for bringing it today. The understanding I, of Christ. Yeah. Uh, brother, brother Rick in Wisconsin is listening now, and he's going to actually put this interview on the Earth Heart YouTube channel so those folks that did miss it will get a chance to hear your words later, and we'll promote it and make sure that the uh, folks know it's out there. Well, we'll see. Yeah. I imagine there will be some people that might even disagree with some of what I said. But oh, yeah. That's okay. <laughs> There's uh there's some folks that actually say that I proselytize and I don't even have one religion. I'm into all of them, so I don't even know what I would be proselytizing. I'm just selling love in different packages, but it's okay. I'm trying to present different viewpoints each week and as long as love is like I say behind all of them, that's kind of my my intent is to bring that, you know, that vibration. Well, look, Derek, I know you've got no time left, but not that I want to rain on the parade here, but it's not just love. Love is a great thing, especially genuine love, which is a verb, by the way, not a feeling. Okay? Love is an action, not a feeling. Romance is a feeling. Okay? But love doesn't justify anything. Love is a good thing, but it doesn't necessarily justify if you're wrong about the truth. You know? There, like I said, if you're dealing with the multiplication table and you love the numbers to come out wrong, it's still wrong. Oh, I understand. You may feel you love it. You know, but that's, love is a great thing that can be misused by humans. Certainly, yeah, certainly. It's, it's not sort of the end all of everything. So when you tell me, you know, I just like every religion or whatever, I take something from every one of them, I would have to disagree that there's only one mathematical table. Hmm. I think we are all... The rest all is nice, it's cool, it's interesting, but it all comes back to your simple multiplication table. I agree. It doesn't jive with that. But there are many... It's not really correct. But there are many languages that are spoken with many different teachers to reach people during, yes. with those languages, and at the bottom end of the day, I think we're all going up the same proverbial mountain. And that's kind oh, of... Yes. I, that's, I agree. I agree with that, because, you know, God is God, but... Right. We have to we have to differentiate whether the things we are reading are translations or simple expressions. I agree. I think Bible, a lot of it's an inspired word of God. 
expressed by men, not translated by men. Mm. And I'm a musician. I get an inspiration for a song on my guitar, and then I get an inspiration for the same song, and I play it on piano, and they don't sound exactly the same, but it's the same inspiration. Right. And, you know, I, I think we're limited with our the ways that we're communicating with our time and everything else. And I think a lot of times, mm -hmm. a lot of things get misunderstood and lost in translation. Sometimes I'm, I'll, yeah. I use the wrong words and don't really convey what I'm trying to say. But I think you picked up on most of it. And I definitely picked up on what you're saying. And I really appreciate your time today and uh, your, your wisdom and your love and everything you bring into the table, including your music. Well, I thank you very much, Derek, and I'm very glad to do it. Okay, well, thanks, and I hope to be in touch with you, Frank, and I uh, appreciate your time. All right, call me anytime, man. I will definitely. Frank Marino, ladies and gentlemen, at the Earth Heart Radio Show. Frank, have a good rest of your Sunday, okay? You too. Okay, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. There you go.